How many different types of genetic modification are there today? How many new types are they trying to add? Well, there's gene editing, and there's a lot of types of gene editing. With gene editing, you create a molecular scissors, and it cuts the DNA, and you have a guide that you attach to it and say, okay, look for this sequence, got it cut. And you can get fairly precise with cutting it, but it can also cut here and here and here and here in these, quote, non-target areas, which can wreak havoc. You can have hundreds or thousands of mutations. And then when the cell by itself reattaches, you don't have any control. And that's when more damage can occur, or more additions or subtractions. So they found that they would use this gene editing for knocking out genes, to shut them down. And they kept doing it, saying, oh, we're knocking out, we're knocking out, we're knocking out. But they had never checked to see if it actually knocked it out. One recent study found out it did 136 knockouts. And guess what? One third continued to express proteins. Some of them were truncated. What happens when you have a truncated protein? Could be an allergen, or a toxin, or a carcinogen. So the gene-edited, non-browning mushroom might cause allergies or toxins or cancer. And we don't know. They may never have tested to see if their knockout worked. So gene editing is one. You can also use something to create RNA, RNA as a silencer. So double-stranded RNA, little piece of RNA, it will match up with the DNA piece and silence the gene. However, if you bite the apple that uses that double-stranded RNA or that potato, these are engineered not to turn brown when you slice them because it's supposed to silence the browning gene, that same double-stranded DNA might silence our DNA, reprogram our genetic expression. And we know that that type of thing does happen between species. It does survive digestion. It do can get into the bloodstream. And there's no real reason why it shouldn't happen. So I say never eat the innate potato or the arctic apple, in my opinion. You have something called synthetic biology, which we can call two different ways. One is to build organisms from scratch. The other is to take organisms like yeast or bacteria and turn them into little factories. They did this in the 1980s in Japan to create L-tryptophan, a food supplement. And they did so to try and create it more economically, but they ended up getting contaminants, almost certainly from the process of genetic engineering, which killed about 100 Americans and caused five to 10,000 to fall sick or become permanently disabled. Now you have companies like the Impossible Burger using genetically engineered yeast to create a protein that's never been in the human food supply before. It's leg hemoglobin from the root of a soybean plant. And the process of creating that, that yeast creates 26 other uncharacterized proteins, plus a bunch of other metabolites. They just scoop it up and put it all in the burger. People are, be are reporting getting sick. There's now a collection of data of people getting sick from the Impossible Burger. You don't even have to be focused on this leg hemoglobin or the 46 uncharacterized proteins. They use Roundup Ready soy sprayed with Roundup. I wouldn't touch the stuff, but that's another genetically engineered system. And they want to use that kind of synthetic bio. They're already creating synthetic vanilla. They want to do saffron. They want to do CBD. They want to do uh, certain herbal properties. They can displace entire ecosystems, entire civilizations and cultures that have been built around creating certain spices and, and Ayurvedic herbs and Chinese herbs by creating things in laboratories that may have vast side effects that we don't know about. There's something called gene drives, where usually if you have a male and a female and they mate, then half of the offspring get the approximately get the genes from one and half the offspring get it from the other. The gene drives will force the offspring to get the desired trait. And it'll pass on that gene genetic engineering mechanism so that the offspring will then pass it on, will then pass it on, then pass it on. So every single offspring from those parents will have that trait. And they want to genetically engineer things like a self-destructive gene. So it'll only create sterile males, or it'll only create something that'll kill off species so they can kill off certain types of mosquitoes, kill off um, mice or rats that have ended up in certain islands that shouldn't be there. And these things could theoretically transfer to other species, causing problems for their whole gene pool. And sometimes they, don't, they have the side effects, which can be spread throughout the whole gene pool. And sometimes the genetically engineered trait will change 
or Shara. So they're playing with fire here, and yet they're still trying to go ahead with these gene drives. The Department of Defense is working on something called HEGAs, which are insects that can deposit viruses in the field, and the viruses have the genetic engineering mechanism in it so that the genetic engineering takes place in the field. We mentioned the double-stranded RNA already built into crops. There's now sprays with RNA where you spray on the crop and it changes the gene expression. What happens if it gets on your skin? We don't know. It could change your gene expression theoretically. There's genetically engineered, well, there's also things that are like culturing meat and cloning, which I don't get into because it's not the type of, of DNA manipulation that I look at. But there are, I actually, there, there's probably types of genetic engineering that no one knows about except the Department of Defense or the elite places that are keeping it a secret. What's common? to all of these is surprise side effects. The most common outcome, surprise side effects. Now it's interesting. The side effects can happen in non-target places. Mutations, hundreds, thousands of them up and down the DNA. But even if you got it right and forced the overexpression of a particular gene so it was producing more RNA and more proteins than it ever expressed on its own, even if it's doing exactly what you want, you still don't have control over the outcome. You still don't know what's going to happen. One gene can create a thousand different proteins through process of gene of splicing up the RNA and rearranging it. Alternate splicing can create all sorts of proteins that are not tested. When you create all that much energy in producing one thing, you may take the energy away from producing something else. When you flood the cell with a particular outcome of a protein, the cell may react to it. The L-tryptophan, the bacteria that created the L-tryptophan, the tryptophan was toxic to the bacteria. So now it's creating tryptophan, it's toxic to the bacteria. What does the bacteria do? We don't know, they never tested it. Maybe that was producing another compound that was one of the five or six compounds that was related to the epidemic. So even if it does the thing that you want it to do, we still don't know enough about the DNA to safely release it into the environment or the food supply. That's the problem. What's different with the topic of GMOs compared with five years ago and even one year ago? One of the main differences now is the cheapness of gene editing, where you can buy a gene editing kit, do it yourself for $161 on Amazon. And also, the biotech industry realized that we got the upper hand on GMOs we educating activists. We taught people about the health dangers, and we, can, we exposed their dirty laundry, and no one believed them anymore, and people are seeking non-GMO by the droves, 46% of Americans seeking non-GMO food. So it's, it's destroyed their plan to genetically engineer 100% of all the commercial seeds in the world and patent them. So they're determined to convince the, hum the people and the regulatory agencies that gene editing is safe and predictable and should just be called breeding. So it should have absolutely no oversight. And they convinced the Australian government. And they've pretty much convinced the US government, who's trying to implement those kind of regulatory uh, hands-off policies, and to force the rest of the world to. So that's what's going on right now, is this big worldwide fight over what regulatory requirements are there for gene editing. Europe says they're going to treat it like GMOs. They have some requirements for health studies, not sufficient to protect the public, but it'll at least force some of these gene edited products to be tested. So we would want it even more rigorous, and the biotech industry is trying to force Europe to relinquish and to change their policy. They've gotten Japan on their side, the biotech industry. They've gotten Brazil and Argentina and Chile, and of course, you know, as they say, the, the U.S. President Trump signed an executive order on June 11th in, 19, in 2019 to essentially eviscerate um, oversight, regulatory oversight, and to push uh, gene editing around the world to convince the world that it was safe and to try and uh, arm wrestle the regulatory agencies into compliance so that, that U.S. gene edited products would be picked up all over the world.